Man, God bless and thanks so much for tuning in. You are going to want to get your Bibles and find 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. We are eventually going to find our way there because that's the text that God's just going to blow apart for us so that we can see how to do it. A very practical and encouraging um, just message and word from God today. Before we go any further... Let's pray. Uh, I know we need to be closer to God, and in this day and age, we need the Holy Spirit's guidance. So, God, we pray, uh, one, that you'll help us to just, oh, man, bring you praise by the way that we act and what we think and say towards other people. And we pray, Lord, that this message will resonate with us. This is one of those ones we lock in our souls, and it just spills out, and we use it, I'm going to say, every day. I'm going to say every day, because what this text covers, we face it every day. We come across it every day. We need it every day. So may these words become burned in the walls of our heart and etched in the floors of our soul so that we may never forget what we walk and stand upon. We love you, Lord. We thank you. Thank you for salvation in your son, Jesus, who died so that we might live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we continue in this encouragement series, we're certainly looking um, at and working our way through 1 Peter. And in these passages of scriptures, we're we're looking at faith and trials and how that works together. Where sort of the goal is to work towards a greater long-term transformation in the midst of immediate trials. So... um, You've heard phrases when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. Uh, Think of any relationship you desire to be deeper, better, and more committed, whether it's uh, uh, sports or maybe it's dating or engaged or married. Maybe it's just something as simple as being a better employee for the corporation you run or work for. All of these uh, verses that we're looking at today deal with that because there is a, a long-term transformation. Well, quite honestly, there are just things that come better with longevity, whether it's being single for a really long time, being married for a really long time, seeing your kids age and grow up over a really long time. There are these things which come in longevity, and this passage of Scripture is going to help us with that. And specifically, we're going to look about how faith interacts with trial. So what I want to do is I want to give you, out of this encouragement message, um, this one thing. And I want you to see the one thing, read it and understand it, so that as the scripture will just sort of bear forth its truth. So the one thing is this, faith in God will produce treasures out of trials. Now, I know what you're thinking, you've been through trials and it hasn't felt like a treasure. You know, you, you don't see it, you don't understand it, you want out of it as quick as possible, over, around, or through, you want to be relieved from that trial. But faith in God will produce treasures out of trials when your trials are constantly placed in God's hands and you are obedient to his will. That's an important, huge part of faith and how treasures come out of trial. So if you want the the suffering and the hardship you go through to have meaning and purpose and value, that's what you do. You just, God, I'm going through this hard thing and you give it to God. God, I'm going through this. I'm just going to follow your will because when you do that, When you follow God's will, when you put your trials in his hands, you realize this truth that suffering doesn't destroy faith. It actually refines it. You think of gold, how they melt it down or steel, how they melt it, melt it down. When you melt in all the impurities rise to surface, you you can think about how the old timey ways they used to make butter and cream and all that. And they turn it and they churn it and they churn it and it would rise and separate Faith in God will produce treasures out of your trials. And isn't that what what you want? And you know what? Maybe it isn't what you want. Maybe you just want to be out of trials. But I'm telling you, there are great treasures that lie within the hardship of life for the Christian, for the Christian. So let me let me just remind you of the context of these early passages, these verses, these sentences in the Bible for that. And the context is, especially for these two verses, six and seven, that we should rejoice that we are a born again Christian. And Jesus is coming back for you. So let's just start there. If you're a Christian, we were just talking to our uh, online Bible study, the Zoom Bible study we do on Thursday. And just one of the practical ways to, for us to worship this week that they do on their own is, is to remember their moment of salvation and praise God for it. And praise God for it. Remember whatever details they can of when they were saved and where they were saved and, and how they were saved by grace through faith and not works of their own. And, and just praise God for it. Now, you will not have all the strength that's available to you to get through trials without being a Christian. 
You're watching, you're listening, you're driving, you're sitting, you've got your Bible out, you, you don't even know where your Bible is. If you want treasures out of your trials, it has to start with being a Christian first. You must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. You must confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You must believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Then you'll be saved because it's your heart you believe unto um, salvation. It's your mouth that you confess unto righteousness. So I would say to you in that right now, be saved. Just simply say, God, forgive me for all my sins. I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I want to live for you. It's, it's that simple. Just call in the name of Jesus and be saved and ask for his forgiveness, for his free grace. And when that happens, get into a local church, find someone, tell them, celebrate that publicly with baptism, text people, social media people, let us know somehow, get in contact with us, help us to know how we can pray for you. And, and being a new Christian, we certainly know there are a lot of ways to pray. So when you move into this context, I'm remind you that Peter's writing to born again people. He's writing to people that are going through difficult trials and sufferings. The government is against them. The Roman Empire is against them. The Jews are against them. Anyone who doesn't believe in Jesus is against them. They're, they're killing them. They're stealing their kids. They're selling them to slavery. They're abusing them um, because of what they believe more than anything else. And that belief is in Jesus Christ. So be born again. Then your trials will be able to produce treasures. And we're going to look at 1 Peter uh, Chapter one, verses six through seven. Let's look at verse six first, just to kind of give us a good instance here of where we are. So in this, you Christian rejoice. So rejoice is celebration. You're, you're not just happy about it, but you're joyful about it. In this rejoice that though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So let's just stop here on this verse. And just camp out for a second and get the landscape of what this is trying to tell us. One, it says, if necessary, you will be grieved by various trials. So you're not always going to be um, grieved by various trials, but at some point it is going to be necessary. Why are these hard things happening to you? Well, we'll see in verse seven, but God wants your response in those hard things to be twofold. One, rejoice. Well, how can you rejoice? Well, because it's not going to last forever. I've sat by many a deathbed at home or in hospitals and saw the joy of the Christian who goes just a little while longer and I'm going to see Jesus face to face. I have sat with people who um, are engaged and just a little while longer they're going to be married and be able to come one with their spouse and be able to live out the rest of their days with them. And, uh, you know, just that, that hardship of staying pure and, and committed. I've seen Christians at the workplace just a little while longer. And, and that's what it says here in this verse. For a little while, your, your life is so short um, compared to eternity, which is forever. What do they say? You, you wrap the... Uh, a rope around the world, take a wing off a fly and lay it on that rope. And that's what your life is to eternity. It's basically imperceptible in the grand scheme of those. So when you look at this, first of all, no, look, it's going to be necessary for you to go through trials. That person who never has to go through trials, that's what we call, we call them spoiled, call them rotten. We call them people who just don't get it. They just don't understand. They just can't care for themselves. Or we go the other side with it. You know, people who just never had a chance in their day. Maybe that's you. Maybe it's like you've never caught in a break. You've never got through stuff. Well, God can transform this. So your response to this that God's trying to get in verse 6, in the midst of your trials, as a Christian, he would say to you, be encouraged because God's going to use these trials and they're only going to last for a little while. And though the outcome is going to be great, we know it's going to be tough. That's why they're called trials. That's why they're prefaced with grieving. So not trials of, of doing things that you love and that are amazing and that they're great to do, whether it's, it's, it's working out or enduring or staying up late, hanging out with friends, that kind of testing a trial, but the trial of just a hard thing that makes you grieve, that makes you grieve. Basically, the Bible's telling us that hardships are handy. They're helpful, even though they may hurt. And they really are. The, the battle-scarred warrior carries experience in life and stories of why peace should be pursued. So when you look at verse 6, I would say respond to know that God is bringing out a good and wants you to rejoice in that. And, and your trial will not last forever. I promise you that. Your trial will not follow you into eternity 
when you go into heaven as a Christian. If you're not a Christian, it will follow you into hell and you'll be tormented for it forever with no hope of release. Let's look at verse seven. So now God's like, all right, rejoice in your trials, which by the way is really hard to do. It, it is very tough to be joyous, to move beyond your emotions or in spite of your emotions to rejoice. But look at verse seven. I'm just kind of giving us sort of the fruit Uh, The good things, the blessings that come from uh, being tested. Verse 7, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, Christian, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of of Jesus Christ. So, so it, most of the time, or at some point in a trial, you're going to be like, what, what's the point of this? There are books written about why does God let bad things happen to good people? Why do hard things happen to good people? Um, why do I have this job? Why am I stuck with this person? Why are these people my family? Why is this the town I've got to live in? How come our world or our country is like this? And here in verse 7, we begin to see the answer that moves us out of ourselves and into God's goodness. So we see that a genuine faith produces very precious treasures that the genuine faith, which how else are you going to know it's genuine and let's just test it. Teachers know this all over the world for students. How do I know if the students really learned? How do I know if they have a genuine knowledge of the subject? We're going to test them. How do we know that their heart is genuinely good? Ask the cardiologist. We are going to test the heart. We're going to look at eyes. We're going to listen with the ears. What do we do? We test things. Why? That brings an assurance. How's your heart? It's okay. How's your knowledge? It's good. How can you hear? Good. Can you see? Sure. And what? If those aren't good, we get corrective lenses. We take adjustments. So you can see why God who loves you so much would want to help you to see how these trials can produce treasures. And I want you to think for a moment of all the people who, who aren't Christians that don't get to have their trials bring about treasures. These are people that are just getting beat up by the world with no hope because they're not in Jesus Christ and they're not saved. So their trials literally beat them down. Their trials literally keep them caged and imprisoned in bondage to sin. Where we as Christians can go, look, we know the way out because we found it and his name is Jesus. So our response to this verse seven in real life is one, remember this, you are precious to God and your genuine faith helps you to experience this truth. I mean, look what it says. Your tested genuineness of your faith, even back in the ancient times of humans, gold was still precious as it is today. And God uses that as an analogy to say your genuineness of faith, which we're going to talk about here in a second, is going to produce at least three treasures that he tells us about. So now moving forward, here's what this means for you. In the hardship for your relationships to get better, your marriage to get better, your dating life to get better, your your work life to get better, your worship and service life in the local church and the community in which you serve, as you seek to multiply your Jesus Christ out into others, all of that comes out and brings about this preciousness that exists. And you get to experience the truth of that preciousness by having a genuine faith that's tested. I mean, look look, look at the the end of verse seven. It says what? There's praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So you're kind of building up this huge pile of these things as you live faithfully. Then when Jesus comes back, the revelation of Jesus, his return or the revelation of Jesus in someone's life who doesn't know Jesus, Lord and Savior begins to produce these things. A point to your faith. And then here's just some practical real life stuff when you go through trials. A point of your faith is to produce verbal praise, honorable actions perceived by others. These are the three treasures. Glory, which is the truth of the name and renown of Jesus Christ among others and the assurance of salvation. Right now, people know like when I was in school, um, they could call or send you to the principal's office. And it was always a drudgery walk down the hall to principal's office because you knew you were going to get in trouble. So as you walk down the hall, it was just gloom and doom because judgment was coming. But we know that Jesus is coming, but for the Christian, it is not gloom and doom. It is a, it's the second, will be the second highest celebrated moment after our salvation when Jesus returns. And he's saying for all the Christians in your faith, in your trials, imagine this. Every time you go through something, it's going to produce one or all of these things. Praise, honor, and glory. 
And I want to talk a little bit about these because I want you to see them, but also understand how they play themselves out in your life. Because these are the byproducts of life when a Christian rejoices in their trials, which is what God wants. No matter how hard the country gets, no matter how nuts things go, no matter how many natural disasters take place, we want to rejoice in these trials because it's just for a little while. So a point to your faith is, is to produce verbal praise in your trials, that God is taking care and God's providing and I know he's watching over me. It, it's also to produce biblical actions out of you and in others. And finally, a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ and others and themselves. So you've got verbal praise, you've got biblical action, you've got a deeper relationship with Jesus and others and yourself. So look, when you go through trials, what do you want to do? So you just curl up, blanket, book, coffee, and just hide from the world. Others want to just run ahead and just not work smarter, but just work harder. If I'm just doing a lot of stuff and distracting myself, I don't have to think about the pain or the difficulty that I'm going through. I can just work and work and work and distract myself and pleasure and pleasure and distract myself and never actually deal with the trial that's before you. But imagine the hard stuff you're going through um, producing uh, praise to God, for God, about God, because of him helping you through this trial. And that's what we call um, testimonies or, or witnessing accounts of going, I went through this, God helped me here, and therefore I can share that with you and with others. It's, it's helping people find their way. It also helps you to act more like Christ. That's what honor is, right? How would you say a person is honorable? Well, you'd say they're honorable by the actions they produce. They bring honor to their family. They bring honor to this company. They bring honor to their spouse or their kids by the way in which they act. And when you look at your trials the way God sees them and tends them, you know that this suffering isn't meant to destroy you, but to refine you and to produce these treasures out. How do we make diamonds? Coals compress in an unimaginable pressure and that dirty, nasty, grimy smoke coal comes diamonds. And women wear them on their fingers, guys wear them, necks change. Wear, I mean, they're everywhere. They're precious. But a, and a diamond is way more precious than coal. Way more precious than coal as far as what people will pay for it. Pay for it, at least in this day and age. And uh, a deeper relationship with Jesus, it talks about that too, right? Glory, where his truth and his name is renowned, where, where you are able to show how Jesus really is and what he's really like. So look at it this way. Sometimes um, you're going to model faith for other people, which is what the Bible would call planting the seeds in faith in others. So sometimes you're just going to model it. Why is it you're so calm when things get tough? Why is it that people come to you in the office and ask you to pray for them even though they don't love Jesus? Because you model it. And that's praise. And praise isn't always someone at the lunchroom just shouting out and amening Jesus, though that may happen. But praise is someone coming to you and saying, can you go before the Lord and Savior and, and pray for me or my kids or my family or this country or this business? That's praise. You're planting faith in others to know there is something greater that can help you. And it's not you. It's not me. It's God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you're going to see it in yourself. This is what the Bible calls fruit bearing faith. Um, this is faith that bears fruit. This is when you see it in yourself and you're like, okay, I've been down this road. I went through this road. Now I need to trust that I can do it um, better. I could do it more like Jesus Christ. I can, I can pursue after it. So you, you take confidence in bearing forth the fruit to know that your roots are so deep that that fruit's going to come out right. Because you've learned how to do it better. So sometimes you're just going to see it in yourself. You're going to bear that fruit out. You're going to more quickly run to Jesus when trials happen than when they don't. And then also, which is what we call honor and biblical action, or under the deeper relationships with Jesus, you're going to see it in others. That's what the Bible calls harvesting. It uses the analogy of the farmer. He has planted the seeds of faith. He has modeled the proper fruit bearing and cultivating and caring for his people and his neighbors and, and those in which God loves, which is everyone, by the way. And he comes to them and says, now it's time to harvest the faith in others. Sometimes that's going to be a, uh, it's going to be the encouragement of salvation to be saved. Other times Sometimes that's going to be the encouragement of you going, let's just stop right here at work and let's just pray. Let's just stop right here in our neighborhood as, we mow, as we're mowing our lawns together and just pray. Let's just take a moment and draw closer to God. It's going to be you discovering that the person you see every day at the grocery store is actually a Christian too. They just were afraid to show it until you did first. And as you live for Jesus, that encourages the other Christians around you to live for Jesus. 
When trials happen to people, we all look, right? We all, we all stare. We all notice uh, funny videos of people falling down and slipping and getting stuck. We see all of that out there. And then those are, they, go, they go viral. It's like, wow, look at this. Because trials draw our attention. They get our attention. So use that trial that you're going through to bring God glory, to generate praise, and to live in an honorable way. So let me hit you with this one thing one last time. The one thing is this. Faith in God, who is God's the Father of Jesus, not just any old God, the Father of Jesus Christ, co-eternal, co-equal with the Holy Spirit and Jesus. Faith in God will produce treasures out of your trials. From this point on, you now know the truth, biblically speaking, that every trial you face, God's got at least three, but I'll tell you from experience, there's going to be way more treasures that's going to come out and it's going to be hard and it's going to hurt. You're going to probably carry some wounds sometimes that you might even have to ask for forgiveness. But in these trials, God wants you to model it and see it in yourself and see it in others to bring about that. So I uh, just remind you in your trials, rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So when your life's all said and done, so this, let me just hit you in the encouragement. When your life's all said and done, or you're living here and God rips open the eastern sky and Jesus comes back, church is raptured, however, however it takes place as the Bible describes it. When all of that happens, or it's something more just immediate, when you come through that trial and you look back and you see the footsteps and the markings of God on your life that he brought you through. Here's what I'd say to close. To close, I'd say you're watching this, and there are other people listening to this and hearing this at the, our, our worship services. Look, don't, don't give up. Be a Christian. Become a Christian. Confess with your mouth, Jesus, Lord, call in the name of the Lord, be saved, be born again. You were born once through water. Now be born again by the spirit. Allow the trials that you face, the illnesses that you have, the incurable disappointment and loneliness of your jobs and relationships to then begin have meaning. Let God redeem you in all of that and know that every time you face a trial, treasures are producing out. And we don't have to go look for trials. They look for us and they find us. So let's pray. God, we pray for all of those in our families, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods that, that don't know you as Lord and Savior, haven't committed their lives to you in obedience and will. Because it's only in submission to God's will and laying our trials into the hands of God that we can hope to have these treasures. It's the only way we can come through perfectly by following the leadership of the Holy Spirit and the example of Jesus. So God, we pray for them that they'll be saved right now. To finally say, you know what? I'm done with messing around. I'm done with trying these other pleasures and hardships and beating myself up and think it can't be better because it can. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but it can definitely be better. So Lord, we pray that they'll be saved and live for Jesus. And for those who are Christians who are praying and doing this, Lord, I pray that all of us as Christians would begin to live it out, to go out there and produce a, a life that represents praise, honor, and glory to God for the good of others, for the furtherance of the kingdom in the hearts and minds of men and women, so that we might be the Christians that Jesus died for, so we might be the Christians that Jesus was raised from the dead for, so we might be the Christians that he sees in us through his wonderful plan for our life. We love you, Lord. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love you guys. Have a great and wonderful rest of the day.